But somebody looks like a unicorn to me, I'll know that they've been working really hard trying to be intuitive. And and I'll say, you know, no, that working hard is you're never you're never going to find it. It's about not working at all and just pausing and not working, not trying, just noticing. So that's that's really what I mean by the pause is stop working, trying to be intuitive or trying to be something in pause and allow and notice. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. Please remember to subscribe, share, and leave a review. In today's episode, we ventured into the world of medical intuition with Tina Zion, a fourth generation psychic medium, registered nurse, and award-winning author. We explored what it means to have x-ray eyes, understand the role of spirit guides in our healing journeys, and discuss how different colors can be used as healing frequencies. Our conversation explains medical intuition and how we can use it to help us heal ourselves and others. Enjoy the show. Hi, Tina. Welcome. Hello there, Julie. I'm so delighted you could join us today. Thanks for taking the time to share your wisdom with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. You bet. Let's just get right into it. What's medical intuition? Well, you know, a lot of people have many different definitions for it. And what I I have a really expanded definition for it, that it is uh, picking up uh, intuitively uh, the, uh, what's going on with the person, what the causes that's happening with the person. But it's more than just because of the word medical most people think it's all about the physical body, which it's a great deal about the physical body. But uh, I also want everyone to know that it's about picking up information and healing the emotional body, healing at the soul level, healing at the um, the cause of whatever's going on. So I have a very, very more expanded view of that. And for me, medical intuition uh, since I, I teach it, I teach people to not just perceive the the aura, the energy field, but to actually pick up that information that's in our energy field, but then to go even deeper in past the skin and notice um, organs that are struggling, maybe a, a joint uh, that is frozen or, or whatever. So I have a, a very expanded view of it, and I, and I love to talk to people about that. It's not just the medical body. It's our relationships. It's um, repetitive negative patterns in our life. It just is, is our, the whole being of a person uh, comes forward is, is what ha- usually happens. I agree 100% as a medical intuitive and energy healer with a background in the medical business like you do. We'll get into that in a minute. I believe that the emotional components are the most important part of a healing because we can help the person heal body parts all day long. But if you're still leaking energy, forget it. What's the point? <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. So, exactly. So exactly. I, I, in my mind's eye, I'm like a human MRI like you. I can see broken bones, torn ligaments, bio, viral infections, bacterial infections, cancer, all of that. And then we want to figure out where did the energy block from an emotional event begin? Where did it start in this life, in a past life? Yeah, I agree completely. I love that. So you say also that medical intuition leads to a profound level of information about your eternal life's story. Does that mean that it encompasses ancestral information, past life information. What do you mean by eternal life story? Hmm. By eternal life story that um, when I work with my divine and sacred guides, that they may uh, show me or pull me back sometimes to a client's, oh, you know, we could go back to caveman days. We could go back even uh, prior to that, we could be taken to other planets, other s- solar systems where that uh, person literally came from, you know, in their eternal 
uh, existence. So I I love talking about this with you because I want people to realize how expanded this is. This isn't just you know fighting a boo boo in our in our body. This is uh, really big stuff, and I I realize you and I know that. So yeah. I love sharing this with uh, your listeners. <laughs> you see lifetimes from a galaxy far, far away, right? <laughs> <laughs> What is that? Is that seen that on TV or something? Didn't I know. I? Far, far away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Star Wars or is it Starship Enterprise? I think it might be Starship oh, yeah. Enterprise in a galaxy. Why be the Starship? I think. Yeah, far, far I think away. so. Hilarious. So, how do you connect with your client? Do you have to be with them in person when you're working with them, or do you do it remotely? Is it a combination? What happens when you have a client that's presenting with a medical situation? Well, quite some time ago, I uh, had an office. And so actually, the medical intuitive part of it began for me when I was giving a lot of Reiki. I grew up in a very intuitive family in the world, mediums, kind of very naturally. But, but suddenly, when I was doing a lot of Reiki many years ago, I was pulled into their body and zooming around in cold, people's colons and in their heart and, you know, and things like that. And so um, it just expanded from there. So I worked one-to-one -one in my office. I received so much intuitive information. I started asking people after a Reiki session, would you like to sit down and hear uh, intuitive information I got? And at first I was terrified to ask people, but you know what? I want everybody to hear this too. No one said no. They were all like, yes, tell me. People are so eager to get this information, for, you know, about them, their, themselves and their struggles and things like that. But to answer your question, I now um, only teach uh, mentoring sessions on a one-to-one, -one, it's on Zoom, and I do classes and courses, you know, and things like that. And some of my very long-term mentoring students I have on my uh, website and they do direct healings and readings now. So I had to make some adjustments because of the, the volume. But I, yeah. the people that get on my website are always the ones that have worked with me for a long time. Yeah, so you know what they're doing, right? You're yeah. recommending somebody right. that you feel really comfortable about. I do the same thing with my graduates. Bless your heart. Yeah. Same thing. And don't yeah. you have to feel very comfortable and, and know that they're going to... Um, work at a, at a high level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think too that we all have the ability to heal ourselves. Everything is healable. Sometimes death is the healing, I tell my patients and my clients, but not patients, clients, but it's a matter of nobody heals anybody else. We help them facilitate healing on their own. Would you agree with that? Oh, I agree with that. In fact, my whole goal is to show people that they are in charge of themselves. If they keep coming to to people for readings and readings and reeling, you know, that I want people to know, that's why I turn more towards teaching it. I want people to realize they can do this for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I agree with family. you wholeheartedly. Yeah, and I use the analogy that when somebody has surgery or they have a laceration, the doctor's gonna gonna stitch it up or use staples to close the incision or the cut. The doctor doesn't make their skin grow back. They make their own skin grow back. And I think that's a great analogy. And and I know you've had people come to you as I have many times where well they'll say they'll say, I've been to 15 doctors and they've given me 15 different diagnoses and 15 different treatment plans and I still have the same symptoms. So I'm coming to you to heal me. <laughs> I always say, okay, take a breath. That's not how it works. I believe what I do, and so I'm eager to hear your take on this, what I do is part of the healing process. It's complementary. It's part of the healing equation with Eastern and Western medicine as we know it, and, and teaching people to follow their guts on, if a doctor tells you something, if it doesn't feel right, you need to investigate. Yes. It's not going to be right if it doesn't feel right to everybody. So 
Absolutely. And I'm a registered nurse and a mental health uh, counselor as well. And I truly believe of that integration because we are in a physical body. So, okay, we can get the staples that, you know, we have to. Um, but there's so much more to the healing process than surgery or pills or, yeah. So I love that integration of, of the, what I call the ooh wah wah and the physical. Right, right. I call yeah. it woo woo. I call it woo woo. Yeah. Same thing, same same letters, right? <laughs> different different uh, sequence of letters. Are you finding that that this energy healing medical intuitive practice is being more readily accepted by individuals, just in the general public, and or, or what kind of reception are you getting from the medical community? I would imagine that you have medical providers that take your classes, as I do as well. Yes. In fact, I have um, a lot of physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners that come to my courses, but I'm also working with uh, many of them on a one-to-one, you know, physical therapist. Um, I've had all kinds of um, practitioners in the, tr- you know, traditional Western medicine. And here's, here's what they usually say. They'll say, I just know things before I open up the door to my exam room, before mm-hmm. I walk in and see the person, I just start getting hits. And they'll say, I want to do more of this. How do I do, how do I do more of it? And so, you know, when the medical field is opening up to this, we're, we're on our way. I agree. And I had a physician on the show here recently, Dr. Maria Amasanti from London, who is a graduate of my class. And she says that she, the more she's done this, what she's integrated is even if the blood pressure is fine and the, you know, all of the, the EKG is fine and all of that, but she's still getting the information that this person's having a massive heart attack. She follows that before she follows the other documentation, you know, and testing and stuff. That's the norm. And she said, she's never been wrong on it yet. It's a, she has a 100% success rate. As I think all medical providers do that follow their intuition. Yes. Yes. And I even have been working with a surgeon for a long time. He specializes in uh, skin cancers. And he said, Tina, since I'm using my intuition, he says, I can just tell what direction I should make the incision to remove the tendrils of it. And so he's just told me that recently, how it's really, even as a surgeon, he's following his, I'm covered with goosebumps telling you, Yeah, he's yeah. following his intuition right. for that. And he said, I'm right all the time. Yeah. My husband had had both of his knees replaced, Tina. And so I gave the surgeon my book and I have a chapter about what happens in the OR, how there are surgeon spirits that are advising the actual surgeon performing the procedure and the patient's guardian angels over the head of anesthesia and all that. And so on my husband's second knee, you know, after he was in the recovery room, the surgeon came to talk to me and I said, you you had a little bit of a struggle with that implant. You had to kind of jerry-rig it a little bit to get it in his knee, right? And he had this look on his face. He goes, wow, you really could see what was going on in there. And I said, I told (laughs) you. And he was laughing. He goes, okay, can you just go home with all my patients? Because he recovered. (laughs) My husband recovered so well. And I said, I said, yeah. I mean, this is real stuff. And I'm starting to be asked to speak to medical students and at nursing schools. And I know Reiki in particular has been taught at nursing, some nursing schools for quite a while. The Sometimes they'll call it healing touch or something along those lines, but I can feel it moving too. I think as the the newer doctors are graduating and doing their residencies, they're more open to, okay, there are different ways to heal and they all can be used in conjunction with one another. Well, you know, also in the medical world, world, they've come up with a term that means holistic to them anyway. I don't know that it means that to the general population, but they call it integrative medicine. Right. And I know three physicians right here in my area that are certified as integrative uh, physicians. 
Uh, and so they they actually have developed, uh, you know, as um, what would you call it, as a skilled specialty in integrative medicine. And so, you know, that's starting here, like you and I talked about, uh, in the Midwest mm-hmm. and is taking action. They're taking action as integrative medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So when you did do the healings and what you teach to your students, how do they connect? What do they experience? How does the information come in? How do they convey it? What's the what's the process? One of my um, biggest concerns is that I kept hearing from people that they were exhausting themselves. Hmm. And when I checked in with that, I found that a lot of people that consider themselves healers, and this happens with Reiki and therapeutic touch and and, and medical intuition, they're using their own essence, their own energy field. And so I really, really emphasize um, to work with uh, very um, advanced high order level of guides and, you know, Julie, I used to work with lower level guides and, you know, some, a lot of people are working with deceased people that are saying they're guides, but they're not, they're different levels of guides I have found. And I want the most advanced. And so I really teach that to be the, the director of a very advanced divine and sacred team and not use our essence because if we keep doing this, I, some some people I've told them they're not going to get as old as I am. They're not. <laughs> they're not going to be an old grandma if they keep giving that energy uh, away to other people. So, be the and it's about like teaching the person be the director of their own body and be the director of a divine and sacred team. And that made all the difference in the world with my accuracy because even in mentoring sessions, they're still we're still working you know, with each other uh, to advance. Um, so I it made a huge difference when I decided to only work with uh, the most advanced level that I've become aware of. Interesting. Yeah, I find it energizing at the end of the day after I've talked yes, to it clients. Should be. Yeah. Yes. It, and people say, well, aren't you exhausted? And I'll say, no, I'm jazzed. If it's, if I'm doing something yeah. in the evening, I got to go relax so, so that I can, you know, get my energy back to normal so I can go to sleep eventually. So yeah, then I agree with you on that. Your own, yeah. You're not mm-hmm. using your own energy then, but right. I'm telling you because I taught Reiki as a Reiki master, you know, back in the 1990s, for probably 10 years or so, and people were using their own energy and not filling up with Reiki first and just Mm -hmm. being, uh, the Native Americans call that being the hollow bone and just letting that flow or letting the flow of your divine sacreds through you, not use your own energy. Mm -hmm. And they weren't even cognizant that they were doing that. Oh, no. They had to be taught that there's a difference. Please explain what Reiki is to those that are listening or watching that have heard the term, but they're not familiar with exactly what it is. It's um, it's actually originated with a monk uh, in Japan. And there's a, a an area there in Japan, uh, you know, really uh, to honor him and uh, Mikhail Yusui. And it's really, I would describe it as a very fine, very light, very fast, very particular frequency of energy. And so he uh, started doing this during, a, I don't know, an earthquake or a big crisis there um, back in the 1800s, I think. And people were just responding to it so beautifully. So long story, it started spraying all over the world. And actually, um, you fill yourself up with that frequency. And when you learn to do Reiki, the, the Reiki master teacher actually gives an attunement for the three different levels of Reiki. And in the attunement, what's really happening is the teacher is, I don't know how else to say it, but embedding 
some sacred symbols into their energy field, which just enhances their energy field and enhances it to um, be the hollow bone for that particular frequency of healing. And uh, it's a, considered a hands-on, but you don't have to have your hands on. It's also a distant, um, because energy is energy. Yeah, right. You know, it, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Right. But that's how I've learned to describe it. And people that this kind of scares, I um, describe it as uh, electricity, that we're very electrical. And so this is really, Reiki's a real high frequency of electricity is really... And we're very electrical as human beings. And so that helps people understand it, you know, somewhat and not be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is and all, it's all over the world now. It's all that's over. right. I always say spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels because the vibration's too low. So we've <laughs> got to raise our vibrational level in order to get in touch with spirit that's going to give us guidance to help us facilitate the person healing, it, whether it be emotional and or physical, and they're, they're obviously interchanged. We discussed that already. There is something, though, that comes to mind, and I, I haven't ever asked anybody this question, but I've wondered it, so I'd love your take on it. I, I went through 12 years at Catholic schools, and in the sacraments of the church, there's one called Holy Orders, which is where a priest is ordained. And I've Ooh. often wondered if it's a similar thing that's been happening since the beginning of time with the attunement or the teaching uh, the student or the priest or whomever to be able to play in a high frequency that connects to spirit so that they can get guidance in order to help others. What's, what's your opinion of that? Well, you know, as you're saying that, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> but so I'm asking my guides and my, you know, and I'm, I'm very willing to say it beats me. I don't know. So I'll ask my yeah. guides. But what they just showed me is, uh, and I know nothing really about the Catholic Church, uh, but when the, the cross, you know, when the priest does the cross, they're really embedding, and I've never thought of this either, embedding that symbol into somebody's energy field. Well, that's an interesting point, Tina, because when I'm at Mass, when I'm in a Catholic church at Mass, and I go most weekends, um, I, when they do that blessing at the end of the, the, the service, I see an arc of light go out and encompass the whole congregation. It goes in a big V. And I also see it another couple of times during mass. And so I'm sure people think, well, you're really devout because your eyes are closed. No, I'm just watching the show is what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's so fun when I go to different countries, especially, and I I do my best to go to mass in whatever country and whatever language they're saying it because I want to see what's going on and how it differs. I got goosebumps talking about this. So this is validation. Me too. So I, do too. I have seen things like rainbow colored arches come up in the middle of mass and then fold back down at the last prayer. I've seen other amazing energetic phenomena in different cathedrals throughout the world. And it and so I've always thought there's gotta be some kind of a transfer of energy at a really high vibration, not just with priests, but with anybody that's ordained, I would yes. think. Yes. Um, I, I can marry people because I was ordained, you know, online for free and you pay $20 for the certificate saying you're a minister. <laughs> yeah. But, and, <laughs> but but the other, I, I don't know that that happened to me at that point, but the other thing I see that's really fascinating too, and I love your take on this, Tina, is whenever anybody gets married, there's this dome of energy that comes down on top of them, regardless of if they're getting married in a church, in a field, in a justice of the peace's office, in their you know, backyard, whatever, it doesn't matter. And it reminds me of the glass dome on one of those old clocks. I have my Mima's mantle oh, yes. clock, you know, that you can With see the insides. That, I think that, yeah, I think they call it an anniversary clock. 
Yes. And it's a yes. dome that comes down. I see that every time somebody gets married. And I've often thought, I bet that's where the chuppah originated in the Jewish weddings, where they stand under the canopy. I wonder mm -hmm. if since the beginning of time, they've been able to see that energy come down. Have you ever, have you ever thought about that or witnessed that at a wedding, for instance? Yes. And, and what uh, is, I think, making a vow. You know, we have to be careful because we we humans are so much more powerful than we realize. Uh, and you and I are realizing it and, and trying to teach other people. They are just as powerful. Yeah. And when we make a vow, that is an energetic thing. It becomes a thing. And I think that's what we are seeing is that literally that vow that's being made and to in a wedding to, you mean in a wedding yeah the wedding, when yeah, they're making the point. vows that's yeah. a thing that they're doing that's a that's a connected um connection and energy and i wanted to bring up i um, was kind of sort of raised lutheran but then uh, we would go to the spiritualist church on thursday evenings for the for the readings but um my uncle was a Lutheran minister, uh -huh. and I was a little kid, and we, you know we'd go sometimes to my uncle's church, and I thought we all went to see Uncle Bob glow because when he was doing his service and the sermon, he became so bright white that I couldn't even see him. So I'm looking around, and I'm you know I'm just a little kid, and I'm looking around thinking, boy, I hope everybody else is everybody's seeing this. We I thought we all just went to see Uncle Bob glow. I have no <laughs> idea what he was even saying because I was five and older, I guess. And see, look at all the things that you're witnessing in these services too. Yeah. Well, and I'm in the Deep South. I'm in Alabama, and yeah. so I've been to Black Southern Baptist churches where the music is amazing and oh my god that it's it's almost like there are a bazillion tinkerbells in there you know lighten up the place they see sparks of of um of energy kind of like at the end of the disney you know tv show where tinkerbell hits her wand and sparkles happen kind of a thing so there's sparkles all over and then i think that the you know, solfeggio music, the classical music, the Gregorian chants, the Buddhist chants, that kind of stuff raises our vibrational level to different heights where we can communicate with spirit more easily because we've raised our vibrational level. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's like I went uh, recently to uh, see this, our local symphony do the Messiah, which oh, is a yeah. very long, long piece. Right. And the, their energy was just building up and then, you know, all above their heads and then the energy would calm down and then the energy would do, Whoa, and the violins would take off. And, you know, what we're really telling everybody is there's so much more to the physical world. And I'm hoping people will hear that, that they can witness this as a as an energy world too, not just a physical world. It's it's a blending going on here. I love yeah. talking. About I do this. too. It's fascinating. I think it's fascinating. I, you know, we always say well, you can't make this stuff up. There's just you like there's you can't you can't make this up. up. Exactly, exactly. Let's back up for a minute. As a okay. fourth generation psychic medium. I'm eager to hear about your other intuitive family members. Were they all like that or just certain ones? And what you experienced as a child, when did you first realize that you could access different energy frequencies and things like that? I'd love to hear how that all unfolded. Yeah, um, the first memory that I have, I think of because of the house that we were in, I think I was around five years old. And deceased people, especially one, uh, and it was he was an adult man, would come in and enter into my bath. And as a little five-year-old, I felt like I was like that. And then he would finally leave. And at five, you know, I didn't know really what was happening or or what to do about it. But in my family, 
we really, everyone's expected to be intuitive and everyone's expected to be a medium. That Julie, it was not taught. We never hardly talked about it. There were, we didn't have little classes or anything. <laughs> you were just expected to see Grandma Marie after she passed on. And you were just expected to, um, you know, I kept seeing a farmer behind the barn because uh, I'd be out roaming around at night. And uh, there was a deceased farmer back of the field on his, <clears throat> in his jeans and this looking across the field. And there, it was never, we were never told it wasn't real. We were expected to know who, uh, when the phone rang, back when phones rang, uh, we were expected to know who was calling. We would vibe each other. So, you know, and I assumed everyone was grew up this way, but, you know, teaching groups like we do, people didn't have that experience. And a lot of times teachers and parents say, you you know, you, you don't see anything. That's just your imagination. Mm-hmm. But um, now my family wasn't um, a very healthy family, though, either. But we were expected to be intuitive and to be mediums. It was um, so normal. No one even had ever talked about it, except if somebody came, we'd all share it. And um, I always like to say at Thanksgiving, uh, one of my nieces raised her hand. Everybody got quiet for a little bit. And she raised her hand. And she said, well, how many people uh, here has had extra uh, spirit activity in their house lately? Then, you know, four or five of us raised our hand, and so we then we, we were all talking about it. And if we'd bring friends to our house for the holidays, they would be shocked at how our family just talks about dead people in the hallways and, and stuff like that. So, um, so it was so normal. I guess that's my long answer, but it was very, very normal and expected but and not um, frowned upon or told you were nuts or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Which most children by the age, I, it's been my experience, by the age of about six yeah. or seven, they're being told, oh, honey, that's just your imagination. Like you mentioned, I get the same thing, which is why it. I wrote my children's books, because I had so huh. many moms and grandmothers say, can you please give me a way to help discuss this with my child so that it, it helps their intuitive abilities continue to, to expand and flourish. We're all of those generations that you know of, you say four generations, you think it stops at the fourth generation out from you. You think it's been like that since the beginning of time with the whole family tree. I say four generations because that's all I know because of my great grandmother, that my fourth, you know, fourth generation away, um, she didn't pass till I was about 12. And I spent lots of time with her. And she was a card. She used cards uh, for card reading. Uh, she would uh, give us little kids uh, some coffee, but mostly it was so uh, the coffee pot was full of grounds. So she would dry the grounds and then give us a reading. But we'd be so excited that we'd hand her our little coffee cup and she would give us a reading from our from the coffee grounds. So she's she's the farthest back that I'm aware of, and mm-hmm. as an intuitive and medium. And then um, my grandmother was my mother, and uh, and you know me, and and now my grandkids, they are all seeing. In fact, my son's little boy, he said, "Dad, um, I'll just make up a name. Tom is standing on the front porch." And my son Andrew, he he turned and looked, and it was his uh, dear friend that had just died three three days ago. Wow. But his little son didn't realize it. He goes, Dad, Tom's at the front on the front porch. And oh, so yes, yeah, isn't that something? And yeah. so it's just very natural for us. And you know, I think allowing it to be natural really lets people open it up. You don't have to hide anything. Yeah. Well, my next question about your your generations, your four generations, did your great grandmother was she born? in Indiana or did she immigrate from someplace else and where'd she learn to read the coffee ground? Um, she was, she was actually, um, I believe she was born and raised in West Virginia, Mm -hmm. back in the mountains. Uh, 
And I don't know if any of us were taught. Uh, she had never said she was taught. However, she was a very active member in the Rosicrucians. I'm glad you asked that. I kind of would not have thought to bring that up. And the Rosicrucians, if you've heard of them, they were back I have, then. Please, please tell people that aren't familiar. Yeah. If they're not as secretive now, but back then, um, you know, she was doing card reading in the 1940s, 1950s. And, and she, uh, there were uh, stacks and stacks all over the house of Rosicrucian teachings. And they kind of look like magazines. But it's a secret order, and it's based on the, their symbol is the cross with a rose in the center of it. Mm -hmm. And she had a little cross that we could look inside this little tiny window, and we could read the Lord's Prayer in this little tiny cross that she had. And so she was, she did her training was really of the Rosicrucians in that very secret order. And then she was very active with the Spiritualist Church, too. And the Rosicrucians, and correct me if I'm wrong, watch the Da Vinci Code or read the Da Vinci Code. They're all through that. But the Rosicrucians, I believe, were were like knights in the Vatican defending the Pope. And then when the church was starting to get corrupt, then they broke off and they said, OK, these guys are, you know, doing some stuff that isn't isn't acceptable and so they broke off and they became a secret society to protect themselves and protect the heritage and the and you bring up a really good point about all of this stuff it's been my experience Tina see if you concur with this where all this stuff's been part of religions and cultures since the beginning of time and as these religions especially are starting to want to gain power, then they take that away from the people and say, well, you got to go through the pastor. You got to go through the priest. You got to go through the, the rabbi to get to God when you don't need to go through anybody. You know, you just go through yourself. You go through your own head. Well, and that's why you and I are out there teaching that the in each individual of us is, is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. This is not a Oh, I tell everybody, too, that I don't have any gifts at all, that this is a very natural ability that all of us have. But, yes, I would agree, historically, you know, they want the congregation to become sheeps, really, and that's part of their language mm -hmm. about it is uh, to be sheeps, you know, for the shepherd, for the priest and the ministers and Right. So, yeah, we agree. I have to agree with you about that. Yeah. And everybody has the ability. It's just a matter of enhancing and developing it. Yeah. You just happen to be from a family that talked about it and acknowledged it. I think most of us aren't. I say I I was not a five-year-old like you with dead people yeah. chasing her since childhood, but I learned how to do this stuff because I'm an inventor of surgical devices sold throughout the world. Oh and former manufacturer. And so I've always been interested in healing. And that's what brought me into this. And what I've found is once you connect with spirit, you can do everything with it. You don't need to just do pet communication and, you know, talking to dead people and medical stuff. Once you're connected in with spirit, you can do it all. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. And yeah. that's my goal is to teach people that I'm not special, that I'm just going to help you figure out how special and, and how powerful you are. You know, that's yeah. what my hope is for anybody that connects in with yeah. me. It's I not me. I agree. Well, it's spirit working through you and me and our graduates and others, certainly, whether they're in a medical profession or whether they're a healer or whether they're an indigenous healer. I mean, there's like limitless capabilities, but it's always spirit working through us and with us to help the person heal themselves is my take on it. Yes. I always say, you know, true balance. Everybody say, oh, you got to be balanced in life. Well, to me, the, the true balance is you have a foot in the physical and a foot in the non-physical in a very balanced 
way and mm-hmm. and you live that's what you and I are talking about in church and seeing the arcs of light and my uncle Bob glow, <laughs> glowing like a big light bulb uh, that that we're in the physical and the non-physical equal and mm-hmm. it's yeah I think it's the icing on the cake you know oh absolutely it makes it very <laughs> fun and very yeah. interesting I agree. So as you mentioned before, you're a registered nurse and you specialized in the mental health field. How does that nursing experience help you in the work that you're doing now to not only help Mm -hmm. facilitate healing, but also in training other people who are in the medical profession and not? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't give it really any thought that's in my biography, you know, and in and, and the books and stuff. But I think it uh, gives a credibility and, mm-hmm. and it helps other medical people realize, well, maybe this is okay if I start perceiving inside of my patient's body and things like that. I think it's, I never thought about this really, but I believe it's probably given me some credibility that, um, you know the you know and I'll say well I uh, you know a graduate of Purdue University and I didn't even realize Purdue was such a big deal back then but um, <laughs> it I think it gives credibility and it really helps medical people to consider even taking um, my course and, and or trying it or not feeling so weird because the medical people tend. When this starts or they start being aware of this, they're kind of freaked out for the most part. Uh, and they need that that balance and someone to say, hey, wait, no, this is normal. This is normal. You should get some hits about your patient before you walk in the exam room or when you hold the chart or something like that. That I think it helped to normalize it for them. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, yeah, that's the only thing yeah, I can think I- it was part of your path to get you interested into this, obviously. And interestingly enough, too, we had a former emergency department physician, Jeff O'Driscoll, on the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he used to, he came out of the closet after he retired. He ran a level one trauma center in Salt Lake City. And uh. he talks about how he'd have. For instance, if there was a car accident with a family and perhaps the wife died and a child and then the other family members were in his ER, what he would do would be the wife's spirit and the deceased child's spirit would be advising him on how to care for their loved ones who had survived that were in trouble from a trauma standpoint. And that's such a great story to hear from a physician who he said there was one nurse in the emergency department who would come get him or they would be able to talk about it. But he said, I was afraid I'd lose my license yes. if I talked about it. Yes. Everyone's yeah. in, pretty much everyone's afraid to let other medical people know this. Yeah. Yeah. But I think yeah. they're all, they all know that it's true because most of them are experiencing it, but they, it's just not something that they talk about necessarily. Well, and people will say, how do I know I'm not making this up? And I said, because you will get so much validation. Right. You know, the physician there in the emergency room, you know, if he says even what the deceased woman is telling him, those, that family knows that there's a truth in that. I'm covered with goosebumps talking about, yeah, talking about it right now. We get, we'll get, we get so much validation of how true this is, how accurate we are, how accurate he is. See, he knew he was Mm -hmm. accurate. Right, right. And for those of you that are first hearing Tina and and me say, oh, I'm getting goosebumps on that. That's just validation from spirit that what we're hearing or what we're saying is true. And everybody gets that. We just don't realize what it means. But I think... I think when you get to the grandma stage, like you and I, we go, yeah, that's validation <laughs> from spirit. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. What are x-ray eyes? Mm. I actually was talking to a doctor, and when he turned around and left the room, he said, well, I don't have x-ray eyes. 
and I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't even know he he knew I had that for you know one of my uh, workshops and stuff. He said, well, I don't have X-ray eyes, but what I um, say about that is that I teach that we have the ability. Oh, and I have to say this too: only with permission from the person do I ever do this with, because I don't think there's anything that I can think of that's more intimate and private than, you know, going into someone's energy field, but in past their skin into any place in their physical body that they're struggling with. And so I only do it with permission, but it always feels like, uh, like a, uh, like a laser beam, of, uh, you know, like professors will shine a little laser beam at the chalkboard, wherever they're talking about. And I feel like I go in kind of like a little beam of light with hypersensitive sensors at the end. And I go in, uh, pick up stuff in the energy field and then the skin and then pass the skin. And I kind of just land wherever my guides land me is how I say it. And then I just start picking up information with images or words, uh, smells, other sensations. But that's what I mean is I get real precise about um, perceiving what's going on. So I call, you know, seeing with x-ray vision. I think you and I are sisters from a different mister because I do the exact exact same thing because same thing. I won't scan anybody without their permission. I think it's a it's a violation of their privacy and it's a HIPAA violation, too, as far as that goes, which is just the, you know, the health information information. But the other thing is I watch a laser beam come from my body to them wherever they are, anywhere in the world or in a galaxy far, far away. And then I have a hologram of them in my mind's eye and I'm like a human MRI. It's like I'm looking at an X-ray or CT scan or an MRI. And like you, I go in blind first because I want to see where the energy is going to go first because sometimes it's something that's asymptomatic that's showing up and we're heading off a problem at the pass before it even becomes problematic and or it can be the root cause of a bunch of other symptoms that they're experiencing. And the same thing, rapid fire, boom, 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 boom. Here's what I'm getting. And then I watch an energetic healing happen that can emulate what I saw in the operating room. It can be something added, something getting removed, whatever. But see if this happens for you, Tina. I get these funnier than blazes analogies. Like I may tell somebody their elbow looks like whipped cream or something crazy. <laughs> but, but it's just how the images come into my head. And what I've realized over the years is it's spirit giving me the ability to convey the information in a way that's understandable to our yeah. human frame of reference. And when we can picture it or get a sense of what's happening, it helps us integrate the healing into our bodies. Do you find the same thing with the work that you do? Very much so, because, you know, if if we can even put it in the phrases that our clients use, it, it, it helps them to assimilate it because we're not scaring them. We're not saying weirdo, weirdo things. We're using some phrases that they would be comfortable with. And mm-hmm. yeah, so an elbow like what'd you say, whipped cream? Whip yes, cream. Yeah. Whipped cream. <laughs> that can't yeah. be good, by the way. But <laughs> I, I use dippity do a lot. Do you remember dippity do back in the day? Yeah, dippity do is a hair gel from the sixties and seventies. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 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 You remember dippity do? And and I, I, it's stem cell energy. And I say yeah. it has the consistency of dippity do, which is like a watery gel. When that first came into me from spirit, I'm like. Seriously, dippity do, <laughs> and they. You know what their response was, Tina? Their response was, "Well, it's funny," and I said, "Okay." And they said, "This is supposed to be done in joy. You're supposed to have fun when yes. you're doing this stuff." And these crazy analogies that I talk about make people laugh, and it lightens up lightens up the mood, which is lightening up their vibration level, which helps the healing integrate into their body. 
Does that make sense? Oh, yes. And it reminds me of this one woman um, client and, uh, well, she was part of a, a, a big class and she kept coming up to me during breaks and she said, I had no idea you were going to be funny. <laughs> she was kind of grumpy about it. She said, I had no idea you were going to be yeah. funny about this. I yeah. said, well, yeah, there's this is joyful what we're doing right. here. Yeah, right. So, yeah, all of it is. I've had people say the same thing. Well, you're you're just so flippant about it. You need to be more serious. I'm like, why? God, it, you know, spirit's pure love. God is pure love. You're supposed to have fun when we're doing this. Well, and some of that seriousness, if we talk more about the energy, <laughs> is actually a denser frequency. It's act actually it's, it's denser fear. vibration. Yeah. And density tends to to jam up and clog up different areas in our physical body. Good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that that way. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about your spirit guides. Is it a is it a collaboration between your spirit guides, the person with whom you're working, their spirit guides, other spirit guides? What do you think that whole crew is that's helping you do the work that you do? For me, and and I'd be interested, it might be different, a bit different or a lot different for you, but I have uh, a team that has grown over the years. And so they're divine, they're at that divine and sacred level, whatever that means um, to most people, but the divine and sacred level of advancement uh, is really what and they're a specialist in something so i have a lot divine and sacred specialist so a specialist like if i'm working with somebody and they uh, have a problem in the organ of their heart not just the heart uh, chakra but the organ of their heart i have a cardiology um, specialty guide mm -hmm. um and so i have specialists and i don't even know i know i have a team once you have a team and you've invited them in they never leave so now I just, I'm constantly talking to them. I'm like a little bit of going, you asked me something I didn't know what the answer was. And, and so I asked them and yeah. whatever I said is what what they said. So I am um, I would encourage everybody to talk to them and develop a working relationship, not just when you're meditating, but talk to them when you're doing the dishes or stirring the soup or something. Um, Put them and allow them. They can't push into our lives. Allow them to be part of our lives and, and communicate back and forth. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, yeah, I, I don't even know how many I have because I've been doing this so long. It's kind of, yeah. Yeah, they seem like a really huge group now. <laughs> <laughs> you have your minions with you. Yeah, yeah. And I don't differentiate with that. I just, it's just natural. I don't even think about it. it I just say it's yeah. spirit working through me and with me. It's God, the mm -hmm. universe, spirit guides, deceased loved ones, the whole kit and caboodle. We had Perdita Finn on the show and you'll get a kick out of this. And she talks about every morning she lays in bed with her husband and they say their morning prayers. And then she has a to-do list for all of her deceased loved ones and her saints and her angels. And she'll say, yes. okay, mom, I need you to do this. Dad, I need you to do that. You know, Saint oh, Virginia, precious. I need you to do this. And she said, it works amazingly well. Yeah. She talks about how she says, everything I ask, they do. And that goes along the line of you saying, when you invite them in, they're not going to interfere. They're going to be, how I think of it is they put like little pings of guidance in our heads. Ooh, for sure. And it's our free will, whether we follow it or not. But when you ask for their assistance, they're boy Johnny on the spot. They want to come in right away and help. Do you find the same thing? Absolutely. And in fact, well, I would... Uh mention a step farther, be more accurate with uh, our words to them. Yeah. Because every word is an electrical signal too. It's telepathy going back and forth. So if you just, if you and I just sat here and called out for help, it's kind of super vague really. But if we really say, you know, do like your example, uh, I want you to do this today. Uh, you know, for me or for somebody else, that's clear. See, that's clear. And they will 
they will jump in and do what what is possible for them to do. But be clear, and I'm not saying that to you, I'm saying it to, to everybody listening to us, uh, be much more definite about what are you really hoping and wanting or needing, and use very I, exact words. I teach the same thing. I always say all oh, spirits right. are super literal. Maybe they were potty trained too early, and they're just, you know, <laughs> anal retentive. <laughs> and they, but, but the example <laughs> that I use, Tina, is... If you say to your deceased grandma, hey, grandma, are we going to enjoy the movie? And you hear a yes. And you're watching some movie tonight on TV and it's awful. And you're saying, grandma, what's up with that? Well, grandma gave you a, they're always going to answer you correctly. They're going to give you the correct answer. And she gave you a correct answer because the way you ask the question can pertain to any movie you're going to watch throughout the rest of your life. Exactly. They whereas, yeah. Whereas if you said, hey, Grandma, we're going to enjoy watching Frozen 2 on Disney Plus tonight. <laughs> that's really specific. I completely agree. You use color in healings. Talk to us about that. How does color come into play? Well, I would say that color is more than just color. It's more than a crayon or colored pencils or whatever, or even thinking about a color. It's, it's color is our color in our aura. Uh, the, when we see color in the auras uh, or inside of the person's body, we're actually witnessing a certain, again, frequency of vibration, of energy. And the, the brighter the color, the more positive the, the body is or the air, that area of the body. And the more dark, more dim, uh, if there's a gray tone, there's usually depression. So, so color, to me, is full of information. And then color in the low, where's the location of the colors that you're perceiving so it's just chock full. Every color is full of information. The brighter the color, the healthier. And as it gets thicker, um, more gray or more brown, it's not as healthy. So you can actually see variations of it too. And that gives you even more information is the shade of it, the location, the shape of it, what direction it's moving. Is it not moving? see all that. I never really thought much about it till I was preparing to chat with you today. But anti-inflammatory energy is royal blue. Inflammatory energy is red to me. When I see an organ that looks diseased, it looks brown or black. A healthy yes. organ looks pink. Antibiotic yes. energy looks fuchsia to me. Does, is that what it really looks like? That's how it's identified to me so that For I sure. know what it is. A viral For infection sure. looks like really watery beef broth, the color of watery beef broth to me. Yes, yes. And that makes sense to me. See? And darker energy. Right. And the, for instance, the antibiotic energy, if I'm scanning somebody, I can tell, okay, you got a viral infection, you got a bacterial infection. And the intensity now listening to you makes sense because the right. intensity of the antibiotic energy this fuchsia color, which is more pink than purple to me, it gets bolder, stronger if there's really a raging infection happening oh, because agreed. there's more intense antibiotic energy oh, more intense, being yeah. sent. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Cancer can look brown or black. Uh, yes. Inside exactly. lymph nodes, I see sequestered toxins that can look brown or black inside a lymph yes. node. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Like little dots or, or blobs, kind of like exactly. sticky blobs. Exactly. Again, exactly. form, shape, location. Right. Absolutely. Back to your mental health experience and, and how you integrate that into the work that you do now. We've already established that we both agree that there's always an emotional component to any kind of medical condition. It's always in place before any kind of medical condition arises. Do you find that when we're taught certain beliefs as children, that it can affect us into our adult lives, even if we're not aware of it? Oh, absolutely. Because again, everything's energy. So if your family is 
spewing, I'll call it spewing, um, anger, hatred, um, you know, racist stuff, whatever, that energy is shooting out of them or oozing out of them and and it's hanging around the house. And so, yes, the child's very likely to be uh, interfered with uh, by the energy of thought and emotion that they're surrounded with. Sometimes I'll see uh, the guides will give me an image of the child swallowing their parents' uh, crap, so to speak, swallowing mm. their hatred and and kind of making it their own, you know, mm-hmm. because little kids are not sure what's going on about much. And and uh, so, yeah, it's very, very real and very important to know about. With your mental health patients back when you were practicing with that, did you find that there normally was a correlation between what they were taught in childhood and how it was manifesting in their adult lives or not necessarily? Yes, because again, um, I consider thought and emotion as one of the causes of um, people's uh, emotional struggles, but also their physical struggles and illness too. So yes, I thoroughly agree with that, that uh, it's picked up along the way as energy, as words that we hear, as trauma. Uh, So I've done a lot of trauma work in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I've heard you tell the story about a client that came in that was raised in a kind of a fire and brimstone fundamentalist um, culture and was so afraid of what was going to happen to her when she died. Can you share that story with us, please, about how you worked with her? I believe you used hypnosis as part yes, of your it, oh, okay I think I know what story you mean then um the uh so I'm a nurse and a psychiatric nurse specialist so I had a board specialty in it and counseling and but I was also a clinical hypnotherapist and uh, I just tended to start doing people kept going into past life regressions and then some people would actually not land on the earth plane in a past life and they would tell me well i'm floating around i'm heading to you know another planet and i thought oh wait a minute they're going to what michael newton calls a life between lives uh experience so this one back to this woman uh she plopped down in my office chair and she said well, I want you to do a regression with me because I I know I'm going to hell. And if anyone was going to find hell, I mean, she was looking for hell. And I even have it as a a blog that I wrote up. Oh, it's also in Michael Newton's uh, book. He accepted it as one of the cases that he put in his book. Um, She would have found hell if anybody was going to find hell. And what, what she found, bless her heart, she grew up in this very, very independent um, church. Uh, and they all followed uh, some man. I don't think he was a minister or anything. And he can he would shame her in front of uh, the congregation. And she had all kinds of terrible stories. So, you know, if she was convinced she was going to help. All she could find, she, she said, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Well, she said, well, I don't see how, but I see a place that doesn't have as much light. And she said, they're looking down. All they have to do is look up a little bit and they'll see the light that they can go to. I am covered with goosebumps right now. She said, I, all they have to do is look up. They're, they're, she said, I can't find it. This must be hell. But she said, there's not a wall. There's not a container. It's not a place. It was beautiful. It was and then, you know, I, I, when she said, I know I'm going to hell, I thought, oh, my goodness, what, what, what are we going to do here? And I just let her do, and yeah. she couldn't find hell because there is a ready. I agree. Yeah. Everybody goes to heaven. Yeah, the, yeah. There's a lack of awareness. I could sure see that, but but she couldn't find hell. It's a good story, isn't it? Oh, I, I had goosebumps when I read it. That's why I wanted you to let it share it with everybody 
As we begin the new year, we often have these amazing resolutions that we all want to do in the year. And that's why health clubs, you know, their enrollment is always the largest in January and that it kind of tapers off by February and certainly by March, a lot of the time it does. But you have a uh, methodology, I'll call it, uh, that you have named the pause. How do we incorporate that in our daily lives? And how does it help us when we do? I love to talk about the pause. Uh, I didn't connect it in with uh, making um, resolutions, but all of, you know the the whole universe is alive, and the whole the whole world around us is communicating to us all the time, and we just get so darn busy, mostly in our heads, uh, or doing you know um, physical work or our jobs or whatever is going on. And really all we need to do is pause and notice. And it and people people I will find if they're working hard to be intuitive, I they kind of look like a unicorn to me because they're pushing out from the from their third eye, their forehead. And so when somebody looks like a unicorn to me, I'll know that they've been working really hard trying to be intuitive. And and I'll say, you know, no, that working hard is you're never you're never going to find it. It's about not working at all, and just pausing and not working, not trying, just noticing. The fact I tell people really, I think the main thing that I teach is uh, just to how to notice the very subtle in life, just how to notice it. So that's that's really what I mean by the pause is stop working trying to be intuitive or trying to be something and pause and allow and notice. I guess allow and, and notice because the world, you know, the earth, the, the, the universe is communicating with us constantly. If people were not at numbers, you know, they'll keep seeing certain numbers. Every number is really its own electrical spurt, its own electrical signal. It's like everybody sees 1111. You know, that's kind of the most common one, at least that I hear from. And to me, it always seems like uh, uh, the pillars uh, to uh, the gates to heaven or the gates to uh, higher awareness, gates Mm -hmm. to awareness of the non-physical realm is very natural around us. It's So I I think every number and number series is uh, a signal. You know, numerology, I don't know numerology yeah. real well, but yeah, it's a, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of energy. I agree. I, I have a lot of threes and sevens in my life. Oh. And in the Bible, mm-hmm. seven stands for spiritual perfection. Yeah. And three is, of course, divine energy. So I find it fun when See? that those, yeah, uh, come yes. up too. Last question. Why do you think we incarnate? Because I, to me, it's all about learning. It's all about our next, uh, like all of us here on Earth right now. Um, so usually, what we bring forward from our past lives is something profoundly emotional, and we tend to bring emotions tend to follow us along into our next incarnation. To me, I've No matter what happens to me, I try to learn from it rather than being a victim of it Um, or, you know, or I don't know what else to say, but a victim of it or succumbed by it or overtaken by it. I try to learn no matter what happens and no matter what happens in the world around us, everyone is an opportunity to to learn in some way. I always think that we're in a, a pathway of advancement. What do you think about it? When, if you I agree. Up- I think we're here to create uh, a life of joy and yes. create what? Well, well, whatever we're led to create. And yes. I agree with you that we bring in things that we want to explore and experience from a different perspective from past lives, kind of like a script and lots of 
subscripts. And then at yes, the same at the scripts. same time, because I see a semblance of scripts that will repeat throughout multiple lifetimes with clients when we're doing past life scans, same which here. are so mu- so much fun because we can corroborate the information we get with historic documents a lot of the time. And again, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah, make you it. Just don't um, know. Yeah, yep. it's a lot of fun. Yeah, you are absolutely a delight. What oh. a what a wonderful conversation. Oh, I've had such a good time with you. Thank you so much, Julie. You I mean are, that. Thank you so much. You are most welcome. How can people learn more about you and your classes and the work that you do? Oh, thank you for asking that, too. Well, my website is just my name, tinazion.com, uh, and I have written two Reiki books and three medical intuition books. I'm working on a book number six now. And um, so really the, all my courses and the schedule is up there and, and um, just my little story of my little bio is on there. So it's just my, my name, my website. Thank you right. for at Tina, TinaZion.com. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. All righty, everybody. What fun to get to talk to Miss Tina today. We're sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama, mwah, where I am, and from Indiana, where Tina is. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan, and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.